can scoliosis cause rib pain. In a healthy spine, the natural curves are in place and the vertebrae are aligned completely on top of each other, meaning in a healthy spine, we have normal sideways curvatures and the spine is completely straight from the front. In a scoliosis, what ends up happening is that it causes the spine to develop into an unnatural sideways curvature from the front. A scoliotic spine um, doesn't bend, doesn't just bend unnaturally to one side, but it also twists. It has this rotational component, making it a three-dimensional condition. In order for it to be diagnosed as a scoliosis, we actually have to measure something called a Cobb angle of 10 degrees or greater to, on an x-ray to determine that yes, this is considered to be a scoliosis and there must be rotation in that 10 degrees. There's a wide range in scoliosis in terms of severity, and the, how severe the condition is can have different effects on the body. A Cobb angle is measured during an x-ray, and this tells you how severe a scoliosis is. And this classifies the scoliosis on one specific classification in terms of severity. The higher the angle, the more severe the condition is. Mild curvatures are anything between zero and 25 degrees. Um, moderate scoliosis is 25 to 45. Severe is 45 plus, and then very severe is a case I like to use that's 80 degrees or greater, roughly. Now, the milder condition, the more subtle the effects they're gonna be on the body, the more severe condition, the more avert the symptoms are gonna be, like, like postural deviation, that could be causing possible rib pain associated with the scoliosis. Now, when scoliosis causes postural deviation, it can affect any age group, but it's most commonly diagnosed in adolescent cases that are between the age of 10 and 18 years of age. And adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, or IAS, is by far the largest percentage of diagnoses that occur, and it's the most common type of scoliosis. The main symptom associated with scoliosis in children in this AIS group is posture. These patients typically don't experience pain. They don't experience any type of malfunction. They normally only see a postural deviation. Now, scoliosis induces a lot of uneven forces into the body and surrounding tissues. And this can affect the way the body is actually growing and developing in this adolescent stage. And if the curve is left to continue to worsen and progress, these uneven forces become more and more severe, leading to higher, higher levels of postural deviations. So the smaller the curve, the less asymmetry you're gonna see. The bigger the curve, the more likely you're gonna see more significant asymmetry. Now, this can occur for many different reasons, but the most common reason happens is something as a principle that we have a growth called huter volkmans principle. When a patient is growing and when a patient is developing, we know growth plates can be inhibited by compression and accelerated by traction. The problem is when we have a scoliosis developing and the patient's growing, there are certain areas that are being compressed and other areas are being distracted, and this is altering development and growth leading to something that we call deformity. The hallmark thing of every scoliosis case that occurs in adolescent stage is that they'll have deformity associated in their skeletal system. And this deformity can be severe or it can be relatively mild depending on the size of curve. Now the posture deviation in many cases is the only sign that you will see that there's a scoliosis. And the most common thing is uneven shoulders, uneven hips, but also something that we call the development of a rib arch. This rib arch is what's typically what they use to help diagnose scoliosis when they do something called bending test, a forward Adams test or forward bending test, because when you bend forward, the rib arches are actually exacerbated. But in addition to rib arches, we can see the head being not centered. We can see seeing the torso and arms and legs appear to hang or have different lengths. We can see balances, uh, changes to balance and coordination, gait. These are all additional signs. But in, by far, in children, the number one thing we see is posture asymmetry. I can't think of any reason that there's a normal condition associated with posture asymmetry. If you see any type of posture asymmetry in a growing child, you should take that significant, you should take that seriously and have that further investigated. Now, how do these rib arches actually occur? Now, the rib arches occur because not because of the bend, but they occur because of the twist. Now, scoliosis can occur in any spinal section, but it's definitely more common in the thoracic spine where your ribs actually attach to the spine. And since the thoracic spine um, can also bend, but it also turns three-dimensionally. And when you have this turn or this twist, it leads to asymmetrical development of the ribs, causing one side of the ribs to protrude more back and one side of the ribs to protrude more forward. And you're getting this asymmetrical rib cage as a result of 
the rotation. Now, because the patient is growing, the asymmetrical pressure and pulling of the muscles causes these ribs to actually deform their shape, and the ribs become shorter and more bowed on one side and longer and less bowed on the other side. And this asymmetrical rib deformation now further progresses to scoliosis. Now, the more this rib asymmetry tends to occur, the more likely it is to cause issues. And especially in the adult stage, as these rib arches get bigger and they're more progressive, they become compressive. And as they become compressive in the adult stage, they can lead to more and more likelihood of developing something called chest pain or rib pain or sternal pain or pain in the back of the uh, back of the spine off to the side on the rib arches. They also, because they're not, not sitting properly, they protrude into the body, they get more compression when patients are laying down on surfaces so they can become more tender and more sensitive. So we know chest pain is definitely more common in the adult stage as a result of compression. Chest pain is also more likely in more severe cases if left untreated. So a left untreated, these curves can progress and they increase in size. And as they increase in size, they can start affecting what's inside the rib cage, which is unfortunately your pulmonary system and your cardiovascular system. And as these curves get bigger, they could be associated with some impairment to the lung, lung function and lung tissues. Now, we don't know exactly when it happens. Like, does it happen at a 40-degree curve or a 50-degree curve or a 60-degree curve or a 70-degree curve? We don't know exactly when the actual lung impairment possibly could occur. It's unique to that patient. Some patients may experience it earlier. Some patients may never experience it in severe curves. The only way you can determine if there truly is a lung impairment, you can't go by pain. you got to have a lung capacity test, a functional lung capacity test, to see if there's any type of impairment as a result of the ribs altering the space where the lungs are developing and growing, leading to some type of lung dysfunction, which structurally could be painful in the rib areas, but it could also lead pain within the chest because of the causing this malfunction to occur. Now, lung impairment is typically only tends to be associated in severe or in very severe cases. So you're looking 45, 50 degrees and greater. Um, in fact, we, we actually think that it's much higher that more likely it's gonna occur. And, and in patients that actually have this type of lung impairment, they may never even notice it, meaning we consider it functional, that they'll never know they actually have a lung impairment unless they're putting very high demands on their pulmonary system, like they're becoming a, you know, a significant athlete of some type. Most patients won't even know because most of us don't use 100% of our lung capacity on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, scoliosis definitely can cause this rib arching that can lead to rib structural rib pain. It can affect the lung capacity or lung impairment, which can also cause some chest or some chest pain. And left untreated, these things tend to worsen. So the best way to avoid rib pain or chest pain as a result of scoliosis is to reduce the size of curve and to reduce the size of the curve as it's progressing so it doesn't become severe and you don't actually have the effects of this. Now, once you start having these effects like rib and chest pain, the best thing to do is to also try to reduce the curve to see if it can help relieve these problems in a conservative manner. Because we know if you can reduce the curve in a conservative manner to actually help the body repair and heal as a result of the structural deformity, you can actually start to have a positive effect on the way the body's responding to the scoliosis. So first and foremost, we like early treatment to reduce curves proactively while curves are progressing. But unfortunately, if you already have a significant curve and you're already experiencing some of these things, we also believe reducing the curve at that stage conservatively can produce a positive outcome. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.